All right, I think the audio should be starting recording. Hi everyone, um, this is the Equal 010 work. So let me just write here, Equal 010. And this is assignment two. Okay, in this assignment, we'll be covering questions in the final exam of 2019 from four, three, four, 10 and 11. Oh, that's not 11. <laughs> yeah. Keep in mind, I can't do Econ 06 right now. Not yet. Later, though. Okay, so let's get to it. Why don't we? Not too much of an intro. Uh, actually, once again, disclaimer, I may not be right. I could be wrong. And once again, I'm coming at the same perspective as you are. So don't take my advice as better than anyone else's. Okay. So we have the following function. F of xy is equal to negative x squared plus 2xy minus 2y squared plus, no, nope, minus 3x plus 4y plus 1. And we want to find that it's concave. Now, if you remember, all right, we can find concavity, okay, by even finding using the Hessian matrix as well. So as you can sort of see here in my workings, which I will put in the description, uh, we find the gradient vector first, and then we find the Hessian matrix. Now the Hessian matrix will tell you uh, what this function has, and therefore if it's concave or convex, okay? So to find the gradient vector, which we defined as d f x y, we need to perform a partial derivative of x, and then over that a partial derivative of y. This will inevitably give you if we're partially deriving by x, so we get negative 2x to start off with, then we take out the x out of here, leaving us with plus 2y. This doesn't get considered. Uh, the 3x leaves us with minus 3, and the rest doesn't get considered. Uh, for the y component, we don't consider this. We get a 2y out of the second term. We get a negative 4y out of the next one. No, sorry, pardon me. This one's going to be 4x. 2x, pardon me, and then you get a 4 out of the 4y at the end. So that's your gradient vector, okay? Now, to get the Hessian matrix, we need to, and I assume you guys know this already, but you'll be doing, uh, so we'll derive these again, first of all. So this is the second partial derivative. So deriving this for a second time partially with respect to x gives you negative 2. And deriving this partially with respect to y gives you negative 4. Now deriving the top here with respect to y instead gives you 2. And it also gives you 2 if you do it on the bottom as well. All right, so you should have a Hessian matrix of that. Now, this Hessian matrix is, as you can sort of see here in my answers, negative semi-definite, okay? This is because the determinant of the Hessian here is going to be negative 2 times negative 4, minus 2 times 2, which gives 8 minus 4, which is just 4. So the determinant is positive, okay? Which means it's a definite, right? Okay, and then we can also see that we have these distinct negative values for our diagonals. So we have a negative definite Okay, which gives, okay, if you can sort of remember, a concave function. All right, if you want to see this function, actually, uh, let me bring it up. Uh, use a bit of visualization software. And you must remember that a negative definite will have a maximum as well, which makes it concave. Okay, so it's going to look like this. Let me pull up the, the 3D software here, if it works. There we go. So let's uh, bring this over here. So we've got the function, uh, pardon me, while I just type this out. Uh, that was wrong. There we go. Uh, negative 3x plus 4y plus 1. 
there we go. So you can sort of see here that we've got this sort of dome shape. I'll give it a bit of a twirl around. I hope that my screen is capturing all that detail. Otherwise it's going to look like a jittery mess. But that is essentially it. Okay. You've got this clear defined maximum point here. Okay. Because we knew that because it's negative definite, there's going to be a maximum and it's going to be concave. So we proved it's concave, right? Now we need to find its global maximum value. So we know that so far it's it's got a maximum. So do we remember? Well, it's fairly simple for three. Okay. To find the maximum value, you, we need to equate this gradient vector to zero. Okay. Let's go over here and do that. So if we if if we are equating this rearranging, we'll get something like two x plus two y equals three, and two x minus four y equals negative four. Now this is fairly easy to do, but just to make it a little easier on you guys, I'm going to just add these two equations together just so you guys can see where I'm coming from. This gives you negative two y, and that's negative one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah negative one. So this gives you y is equal to a half. Okay. Substituting this back in, you get negative two x plus one equals three, which establishes that x is equal to negative one. So we've got these two, we've got x is equal to negative one, and we've got y is equal to a half. And then you can find the value of f of x by substituting all these values in. So I, I won't show you the faff from it, but essentially what you get is f x y is equal to about seven over two. Okay, so inevitably your maximum point is gonna lie at negative one, a half, seven over two. And if you'd like to actually check that, we can look at our little visualization here and actually find that if I type in what I just got, 3.5, you can see that that point is at the maximum. So we can verify, yep, that's correct. Nice, okay. Right, so that's number three. Fairly easy. I think everyone really got that, so I don't think I need, really needed to do much with it, but I think it's important to cover anyways. Now, number four. People are having a bit of trouble with this. Now, concerning the difference equation y, t plus one, plus a, y, t is equal to b, where a and b are constants with a is not equal to negative one, we want to find the stationary solution. So stationary solution. Let's not actually, let's not write solution. It's going to take too long. We want to find the stationary solution. We want to find the complementary solution. It's a solution provided free of charge. And then the general solution. <coughs> right. Is that? Yeah. Okay, so what, how do we get each solution? So to get the stationary solution, we simply set either of these two, the y t plus one and the y t, as just y. So we essentially just calculate for y in an equation like this. Okay, that's how you kind of get the stationary solution. You just put in your y's, okay? Here, it's kind of fairly obvious how you get that, but what we say at the end is that big y t is equal to b over one plus a, because you can factorize it out, get like that. You can kind of see how we got that, okay? So this is how we get our uh, stationary solution. Now from here on out, the it's gonna get more complicated, uh, as you can sort of see from my workings already. I'm just gonna read them. Now to find a complementary solution, we need to find the associated homogeneous equation and then the general solution of that associated homogeneous equation. Okay. So we have so far uh, got, yeah. So we have our stationary solution, which is set as this. This is our stationary solution. And then you have our original equation, which is y t plus one uh, plus alpha y t is equal to b. Okay, and then we want to, actually, this is kind of the wrong way around. We want to subtract the stationary from the original. So you want to move this down and we're going to be subtracting this from that. Okay, this sort of gives you an equation that looks like this. You've got uh, 
y t plus 1 minus big y t. Uh, oh yeah, hold on, big y t plus 1. I don't, I don't exactly know why that's true, but just go with me on it. Because uh, I'm pretty sure it's damn true. Uh, there's also, uh, hold on, let me actually get the book open for this. If you guys could just bear to listen to me for a little bit. Maybe I can just pause the recording for a bit. Hold on. Uh, okay, hold on. I'm back. Okay, so if you guys are curious on the exact solutions to this sort of stuff, there are quite a few examples in the book. From page 519 onwards, uh, especially uh, under subsection qualitative behavior, in 522, there's a lot of help, essentially. Uh, so have a look at that if you're having a bit of difficulty. But essentially what's gonna happen is in our equation, we will get something that looks sort of like this. Uh, plus a, why did I get that? Hey? What the? Oh, that's the wrong way around. Um, <laughs> yeah, hold on. Let me edit that. Uh, so it's... Yeah, hold on. <laughs> Pardon me, everybody. I just messed up a little thing, and I'm just going to correct it now. And then that's going to be adding to this. Oh, that, that, I've made it even worse. <laughs> And then t plus one. What is that? No, don't make it t plus one, <laughs> till lord. I'm messing up so many times. Um, and then copy. I do apologize for the sort sort of sudden <laughs> diatribe off with off what we were doing, but this is important to correct. Otherwise, I will not remember it later. There we go. Did that work? It did. Hooray! Okay, so now that we've got this, we've got uh, an equation in terms of variables that look like y t plus one minus y t. Okay, t plus one, there we go. Uh, so we're gonna define a variable which is uh, called z, which is equivalent to, uh, well, z t is equivalent to y t minus capital Y T. So what we're going to say here is that Z T minus A Z T equals zero. Oh, it's, it's plus, isn't it? Yeah, it's still plus. <laughs> Do excuse me. <sighs> Dear Lord. Okay, just look at this. It's all right now. Um, and the general solution to this, this is said in many places in the book, but the general solution to this is found by switching sides so that you get Z T plus one is equal to negative a z t, and then you eventually get uh, from a lot of stuff. But the general solution here is that z t is equal to capital A, where a is some kind of arbitrary constant, which is times by negative a, the one we had before, to the power of t. And so this, uh, and, and then as we switch back to y yt so we're moving this back here so moving it back to this we get yt minus capital yt is equal to a negative a t yep so we get eventually okay so wait hold on what was it yeah so the general solution for that is Yeah. So yeah, hold on. Let me let me actually establish this. This here, this is the complementary solution. Okay. So this is complementary. Okay. The what we got earlier, y t is equal to b uh, one plus a. This is the stationary. And then we're going to, we're about to get to the general here. So switching it back gets us closer to the general. So we have a yt is equal to capital YT plus 
arbitrary constant minus a to the power of t. Okay, and as we know, this constant here is b1 plus a. I believe so, yeah. b1 plus a. Actually, rearranging this, let's just make it look a little neater. We eventually get the general solution, which is arbitrary constant minus a t plus b over 1 plus a. There you go. And so that should be your general solution, this one here. So this is the general solution of what we've got. Okay. So we now need to find the range of values of A for which the stationary solution is stable and for which it is alternating. So for it to be stable, we need to think about this. Okay. So for a stationary solution to be stable, this part here as well, we need to think about like what value of A would essentially make things go worse. Okay. So yeah. So yeah, we need to determine basically what the book says and what I'm reading off my notes here is that we need to determine if Y T as it approaches capital Y, um, as T approaches infinity, if this is true, then it's stable. Okay. So this will be stable. Okay. So if this is to be true, okay, we need to know, because if y t is to approach capital Y, which is over here, we need to reduce this central variable. Okay. So t needs to tend to infinity. So a, negative a, and t. And because t is tending to infinity, it's going to continue increasing, essentially. Okay. Now, what about that value of a in there? Well, if, let's say, a is negative 6, right? But then we'll have a 6t, and then it'll perpetually increase, right? What if a is negative 2? Oh, dear. No, I don't want to open a Zoom meeting. Thank you very much. So if we have a is 2, then we get negative 2t, but it still increases, okay? The important thing here is for the magnitude of a to be smaller than... Well, yeah. The magnitude of A needs to be smaller than 1, essentially. You can also say minus A as well. It really won't matter. But the important thing here is that the magnitude is smaller than 1, so it doesn't explode out of proportion. Okay? The solution is stable for this. Okay? That's when the stationary solution is stable, because you get that. Okay. Uh, then we also have the general solution is alternating. So the the general solution alternates, then our base has to sort of switch each time. So imagine if I have negative 2, and I need to times by negative 2 to get to the next one. So you have 4, and then negative 8, and then 16. This is an alternating solution. Uh, so we know our base has to be negative, okay? Only with negative bases will you get alternating solutions, okay? With a 3t, you would get 3, 9, 27, 81, but you will get alternating ones where you get negative 3, 9, negative 27, 81, you get it. Okay, so our base has to be negative. So we know, we know that negative a, okay, negative a has to be, essentially speaking, smaller than zero. Okay, which is pretty easy, right? So basically negative a has to be smaller than zero. But we can also switch it around. A kind of has to be larger than zero as well, okay? Because if a is smaller than zero, then it's going to cancel out that negative in there, okay? So this is what's true. When a is larger than zero, it is alternating, okay? When a is smaller than zero, it's not going to alternate instead, okay? So that's the, um, that's the solution to ii. And for i, it is smaller than one. Okay. Right. Okay, now, I'm very well aware that, hold on, let me just check the time quickly. Yeah, it's 20 minutes in. I'm very well aware that lots of people have had problems on question 10 and question 11. Now, hopefully I should be able to work through them, but they're probably going to be difficult to explain, so bear with me. So let's move to 10 here. Hold on, let me just, I'm going to sip my drink. Mmm, delicious 75p lemonade. Anyway, so 
First of all, we have to explain what is a homogeneous function of two variables of degree h. So we all know what a homogeneous function is. For example, if I have the following, where I'm typing both my lambda, the homo homogen homogen homogeneity, the homogeneity, sorry, the homogeneity of the function is determined by that n there. Okay? Basically, what you get for what you put in. Okay? Now, n here represents essentially like our return to scale almost, right? Because we put in one lambda and we get out some other kind of lambda. Yeah? So, that's sort of how it works. Uh, but if our function has is a homogeneous function of two variables of degree h. Okay, so what this is essentially going to be, we're going to outline it as f x1, x2, which are both going to be times by lambda, so I've written them wrong. So lambda x1, lambda x2, and because it's homogeneous of degree h, we're going to write it as lambda h of f x1, x2. Okay, so that's our return to scale of it. Okay, as you can sort of see here, I've already written that. Okay, now for now we have to prove that the partial derivatives are homogeneous of degree negative h1, essentially. So if we want to do a partial derivative of this, okay, if we do a partial derivative of this one, if we also we're going to call it f1 because we're doing it by x1. Okay, so we're going to do a partial derivative by x1. So the function stays the same. But when we partially derive such a function, one lambda is left out. So it sort of stays like that. When you partially derive a function on the other side, uh, it kind of stays the same. So you have that there. And maybe some of you can see where I'm going with this. Because we've got a lambda on this side, we can just divide by lambda. So we are left with f1 lambda x1, lambda x2 on this side, and dividing by lambda, we get lambda to the power of h minus 1 on the other side. Okay, et voila. So now we have a partial derivative that has a homogeneity degree of h minus 1. So that's sort of it. When you partially derive this function on the left here, that lambda gets left out, and then you can incorporate it back into the um, homogeneity. Okay, now we need to figure out, now, for a homogeneous function of two, uh, for a homogeneous utility function of two variables, uh, we need to find the slope of the indifference curves along the line. So I used u, and then you've got uh, lambda x1, lambda x2, which is obviously going to be equal to the uh, well, it doesn't say the, yeah, it doesn't say the bloody thing. Oh, well. Um, so this is, we're going to say this is equivalent to, essentially, um, yeah, actually, sorry, let's, let's define the, the function a bit more concretely first. So let's say our utility function is defined as such. We've got two variables, and we've got x1, which is also has a power of alpha, and we've got x2, which has a power of beta, Okay. If this is homogeneous, so we're going to get u, and we're going to have lambda x1, lambda x2. You're also going to get uh, that lambda x1 in there to the power of a, and we've got lambda x2 to the power of beta. Yeah? Now, uh, taking the lambdas out of this, we get lambda alpha uh, out of x1 alpha, and then lambda beta out of x2 beta, and so you get lambda alpha plus beta out of the function we originally had, essentially. Okay, so we know that the return to scale here, okay, the return to scale of the homogeneous function is, well, not really the return to scale, but the, the degree of the homogeneous function is alpha plus beta, right? Okay. So we know that at least is true. Uh, so deriving with respect to x1, let me just check here. Yeah. Yeah, so we've we've determined the homogeneity of the function. This isn't really necessary, but I did it for some reason. It's in my notes, so 
I remember. Um, so let's derive this function over here. Okay, we're looking for uh, we're looking for d dx two dx one, which it can be calculated through the partial derivative of hold on. It's going to be negative of the partial derivative of u over the partial derivative of x one divided by uh, partial derivative of u to x two. So that's sort of how you calculate it. Uh, this will give you, uh, if you sort of think about this, it's going to give you negative alpha x1 alpha minus 1 for the power, and then x2 beta. And this is going to be divided by the beta version. So you're going to have beta uh, x1 alpha, and then x2 beta negative 1. Okay, which should give you the dx2 dx1 function of negative alpha x1 alpha minus 1 x2 beta and then we're going to use that I see most of you got up to this point by now uh, cancelling this out you eventually get negative alpha x2 and negative beta x1 okay so, if we hold this constant to some random gradient, okay, let's say this gradient is, for example, uh, gradient of A, okay? So let's just say the gradient we want on our, on our curve, like this, okay, let's just say we want some gradient A, okay? All right. So, to, in order to establish this, Okay, rearranging for this, we get uh, negative alpha x2. You can sort of think of x2 here as y, if you'd like, uh, but you've got alpha beta x1. And so rearranging for x2, you eventually get uh, alpha beta over, oh, well, negative alpha beta over, no, no, <laughs> dear lord. You're going to get negative a beta over alpha x1 and that's going to be your sort of um, tangent as well there okay because this represents all the points that have this specific gradient okay which can be said to be sort of something that looks like a y equals cx right if you think of minus a beta over alpha as c Okay, as you standardize at a constant c, you have a, basically a the gradient of the indifference function is constant along this line. Um, again, you can sort of think about x2 and x1 going into their respective categories. Yeah, but you can sort of equate those two. So minus alpha beta over alpha, <laughs> minus a beta over alpha can be equivalent to c here. So it all kind of fits in neatly. Uh, doing a diagram here, if you guys can kind of, hold on, let me try making this full screen. Uh, full screen, full screen. There it is. Uh, that's not really full screen. Hopefully you guys can see enough of that. But you can see that you've got that consistent line, starting from the origin, and you can see that all points on the indifference curves here all have the same gradient. As you can see, they've all got negative two. Okay, so hopefully that's a little helpful. Okay, so... Moving on. Now, I think this is the part most people got stuck on. Okay, we have now got a function, a production function in particular, QFKL. So you've got the output dependent on capital and labor. Okay, suppose further that it is homogeneous of degree one. Okay, so let's first of all start off with that preset. So we have F lambda K lambda L is equal to lambda fkl so there is a constant return to scale here okay show that the production function can be written in the form q l phi k okay so what we sort of do here okay is we kind of deconstruct it down so we start by first of all remember here it says that k okay this little so we want it in let's just look at what we want at the end Notice that phi k, actually, oh, let me draw phi correctly. Uh, phi k, remember that little k is going to be in terms of k and l. So I'm going to have to divide by l at some point. Oh dear, needed to rub it out there. 
Okay, so we're going to divide by L on both sides. This is going to give me a function of lambda k over L and lambda, given that I've taken out the L. And it's also going to divide it by L on the outside of the right side. So you have this now. Okay. Uh, we're also going to take the lambda out of the left side. So we get lambda f k over L and 1. At this point, this function here is essentially phi k, but we still have a bit more to do. Okay. So we're now simply going to cancel out, really. So we're just going to cancel out those lambdas there. This gives you f k l 1, which is equal to 1 over lambda of f k l. But what does this k l look like? Well, it looks like q, doesn't it? Okay, so you have, actually I'm going to switch sides, q times 1 over lambda, 1 over labor, is equal to f k l, k over l, 1. And then times it by l, you get q is equal to l f of k l over 1. Now, we know that this f k l over 1 is phi k. So we simply write it as such. Okay, and then we end up with q l phi k. Voila. Let me go over that again, just so you guys didn't miss it. Okay, first of all, there it is, in case you need to take a picture. Okay. We divided by L on both sides in the variables. Okay, so divide each variable by L. Okay. This gives us that homogeneity. All right. The, so the lambda is going to be dividing by L, and within the brackets here, it's also going to be dividing by L. Remember, this is all within the brackets so far. And then... Moving our lambda out uh, for the left side, we can cancel them out. So we're left with our sort of uh, weird k over l function. Then we simply uh, go forward, realize, oh, fkl could just be written as q, switch to like that, and then times by l on both sides. And you got it. Okay, so this is sort of how you get q l phi k. Okay. Uh, again, if you guys want more detail, it will be in my notes. Now, we are going to actually use this exact same method with the next part, okay? So, doesn't it look familiar? So we've got an QFKL, so we can almost define this as F of lambda K lambda L. All right, let me zoom in actually a little bit. And we are going to times each variable in the next equation by lambda. So let's first of all start off with the k at the start, which is going to be by negative 2. And then you've got the negative 2 of the L. Then you've got negative a half. Okay. So uh, this eventually, we can take actually here the lambda negative 2 out of this. Sort of keep it the same, even. So let's just... Uh, up another blockade there. <laughs> so then you have that negative a half, but then as we remove that, it just becomes regular lambda because negative two times negative a half is just lambda, shockingly enough. So it is homogeneous of order one, as you can see here. Okay? Pretty easy. Okay? So that's how we show it's homogeneous of degree one, which means we can use our method. Okay, so using our method here, we know that, okay, so we're going to first start by having our function, well, we know that, let's first of all, so function uh, of this, so we know from our last step that this is true for a homogeneous function of degree one, okay? Therefore, we're going to rewrite this left side as the function itself, in this case. Um, we're going to actually, in this case, um, get the function, which was previously defined like this. Okay. 
Now, what did we do next? Well, we actually divided by L. And remember, we're dividing those variables, not the actual function overall. Okay, if you divide the function overall, it's not gonna have the same effect. So what we get here is lambda KL to the negative two plus lambda negative two, negative a half, which is equivalent to lambda L F K L. Okay. Going further, okay, we can almost define this as sort of Q as well. So I'm just going to erase this and write Q instead. Then we're going to take the lambdas out of the left side. Okay. As we sort of already know that those lambdas aren't exactly going to be, you know, perfect, uh, it's going to have a sort of a different result. So the lambdas are still to the negative two power, so as we take them out, it still has just one lambda. So we have KL inside still, though, like this. And then because we've taken the lambda entirely out of this area, we just get one, right? To the negative a half. Still there. This is equal to this. Cancelling out those lambdas, we get that. And then multiplying by L, as a matter of fact, uh, you end up with this. That is your end result. Now, as we know from what we did earlier, okay, this is essentially equivalent to L phi k. And now we can see that this section here, actually that looks less like an L, more like a like a squiggle L, okay? So we can now see that this section here, as is a matter of fact, phi k, okay? Because we've now got a function purely in terms of k over L. So we now know that the function phi k in this one is equivalent to k L negative two, plus one, bracket, negative a half. That is our phi k function here, okay? All right. So that one's a big one. I'll just show the workings overall there, just in case anyone's confused. Let me take a sip. Now we're gonna get onto 11, the trickier one. Okay, erasing. Okay, time for another one. So, for number 11, we first of all need to find the degrees of homogeneity of the function we have. So we have a Cobb-Tarkless production function. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this fair function already, but I'm just going to write it out again. So you have capital and labour. Capital has A, labour has B. Thankfully, it's literally just A and B, no alpha, beta here. Okay. So here, the homogeneity is quite different. Okay, so if we were to put in, so we have f lambda k lambda l, you get lambda k a lambda l b, which gives you lambda a k a lambda b l b, which gives you lambda a plus b of the original function. So, uh, the degree of homogeneity here is a plus b. Now, what this asks for, determine how returns to scale depend on a and b, and find the marginal products of capital and labour. Okay, so as we said, a, the degree of homogeneity determines the return to scale. If a and b is above 1, we have increasing returns to scale. So basically, what you put in, you get more out of it. Okay. This is because, essentially, for the lambda we put in, we get out a higher power of lambda. What do you know, you know? A and B, shockingly enough, is constant returns, if it's equal to 1. And it's diminishing returns, if it's lower than 1. Returns, if it's lower than 1. 
All right. So that's the main thing. Now, we want to determine the marginal products of capital and labor now. We are now going to simply just put in, just get a partial derivative out of it. Okay, so we simply just want partial derivative Q to K and the partial derivative of Q to L. Okay, this should be fairly easy to get. Uh, looking at our function up above there, you've got that function there. Simply deriving the K, we get A K A minus one. LB, and then we've got for the L a similar thing. We've got B, K, A, L, B minus one. So these are our these are our marginal products. Okay, so essentially this is the this is what increase you'll get from a singular increase in capital. Uh, so the marginal products there. So that's what you that's what you get. So now we want to show that each isoquant is negatively sloped. Okay. So isoquants, as you may remember, kind of look like that. Okay. So you sort of have stuff like that. No, they don't rise like that. So they sort of look like this, depending on how big the change was. So here, it wants us to prove that the isoquants are negatively sloped, convex, and the axes have asymptotes. To find if they're negatively sloped, we're gonna to have to find uh, DLDK. Now, you may remember DLDK being calculated by our usual way of doing it, which is as such. And thank God we've already found these things, right? Okay. So remember, if you always wanna find a function like this, you're just gonna to have to divide it like that. Okay. Uh, so this is our just general rule. So to find DLDK, we've already got what we had before, so we're going to use negative A, K, A, minus 1, L, B, and B, K, A, L, B, minus 1, which, shockingly enough, simplifies to A, L, B, K. So that's our sort of a, um, our diminishing returns. Now, why is the isoquant negatively sloped then? So, we already established earlier in the question that A and B have to exceed zero, right? It says, determine, denote output capital labor respectively where A and B are positive constants, so they have to be above zero. Labor and capital also have to be above zero, because they can't be anything else. You can't have negative labor and capital, okay? Actually, it can be larger than or equal to zero, essentially. So, what this means is that this can never be positive, so it's pretty much always negative in this case. Okay, always negative, because everything else here is positive. Okay, so it's always negative. Now, to find convexity, you could do the traditional way and find the second derivative, but I'm not going to suggest that. Okay, an easier way to see it is just to look at the function itself. Okay, so what happens when I increase k? Okay, so if I increase k, let's just uh, rearrange this. If I increase k, or actually if I diminish k, so k moves further along. So if this goes down, l has to go up, okay? If l goes down, k has to go up, doesn't it? So it's always going to be an inverse relationship with these two, okay? So for example, if the total outcome here was like 10 instead, y, uh, l would have to take that and would, I don't know, say, oh, let, let's not actually pose hypotheticals. But essentially here, because there's always going to be an inverse relationship, it's always going to be convex, okay? Because when k decreases, l increases. Hold on, I didn't write that. Okay, so it's a pretty intuitive thing. You can, technically speaking, go for a... Uh, for a second derivative and prove it like that, but it's not necessary, essentially. Okay, so just showing that they have an inverse relationship is enough. Okay, showing that they never increase at the same time is also enough. Okay, because these alphas are always out a and b are always going to be positive, there's not really going to be a chance for them to go negative. So these are always positive, so there's never going to be a sort of a flip around, so they're always going to be inverse to, to each other. Okay.
Now to show that they are negatively, uh, to show the axis of isochords, we can sort of think of the function again, okay? And you can think of, well, what happens as k tends to infinity, okay? Well, as k tends to infinity, okay, let's, let's sort of rearrange this again. If k tends to infinity, then k a is also going to tend to infinity, which underneath q is going to mean that l is going to tend to zero, right? So think about that. As k tends to infinity, l tends to zero, right? So we can sort of think about it like that. But given that l equals zero is one of the asymptotes, okay, that shows that as k increases, l is going to get closer to that, that bloody um, asymptote. Okay, so given the asymptote is L equals zero and L is tending to zero, that shows it's the asymptote. Same thing for the other variety. As L tends to infinity, you've got the same thing. You've got Q over LB equals KA. As LB tends to infinity, K is gonna, KA is going to tend to zero, which gives you the second one alongside K equals zero. Okay, so you've got that sort of going up. Okay. Again, these last two parts are quite intuitive. You don't need to spend too much time on them. Okay. Now, here's the big one. When the price... Oh, hold on. Uh, also, if you need to sketch an isoquant diagram, let me show you mine. And let me put it in full screen. Where did it go? <laughs> there it is. Okay, so that's sort of like a nice isoquant diagram. So just show it like that. Okay. So, this is the hardest part. When the prices of capital and labor are R and W respectively, find the conditional input demand functions and hence show that the minimum cost of producing output level Q is that mess. Okay, so we're gonna be doing a cost minimization problem. This is a constrained optimization problem, so we're gonna use Lagrange for it. Okay, but what are we minimizing? This is the important part. Okay, it says here that the prices of capital and labor are R and W respectively. So what's going to be the cost overall? So the cost is, well, the price of capital times how much we're using, and then the price of labor times how much we're using. Okay, so the price of capital is R, okay, times capital, and then wage times labor. And this is our cost, okay? This is what we're minimizing, all right? So we have to minimize this function here. Okay. Now what do we have to minimize it to? Well, we actually have to minimize it to our production function. Q is equal to Ka LB. So minimize, can't even write at this time of the morning, relative to this. We can form a Lagrange using this. Okay. Using this, we can sort of just do Lagrange of K, L, and lambda, which would give you, let me just double check my work here. Yep, it would give you RK plus WL minus, and remember it has to be equal to zero, first of all. So you look K alpha, L beta minus the Q. Okay, all right. Now remember, in order to find the critical points, we need to make sure that the, the partial derivative is equal zero. Also, I'm going to be putting a line over the Lagrange just because it might get mixed up with uh, labor. Okay, so the derivative of the Lagrange to the k plus equal zero, and the derivative of the, I mean partial derivative too, excuse me, the partial derivative of the Lagrange to the labor also has to be equal zero. Okay, so first of all, that partial derivative to k, this should be fairly easy to get, but I'll just write it out. It should be r minus, uh, that's going to be, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to times my lambda there. Poor form on my part. Okay, so you're going to be having alpha lambda k a minus one. Uh, and there's no l beta, is there still an l beta there? I think not. Yeah, l beta just sort of works as a constant. Uh, but the Q is going to get cancelled out. I know that for sure. Okay. Uh, so you have that, but that's also going to be equal to zero. 
And we also have the same one for L. So you've got the wage here, you've got B lambda K A L B minus one. Okay, and this is also equal to zero. Now surprisingly enough, this literally gives the functions these are equal to that. So now we know the basically how to represent um, either rent, I think that's R is rent and W is wages. Yeah. We now know how to sort of represent them. Okay. Now, in order to sort of find, okay, so look at our original function. Okay. We're going to have to minimize it relative to this one, right? So we're going to need to find, and also, also look at our end here. Oh, let me zoom in. You guys can sort of see that in the bottom right corner. You can see that it is all in terms of A, B, R, W, and Q. There is no K and L. So we are going to have to find ways of representing K and L in terms of R and W, or A and B, or whatever, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide these two functions. This gives you R, W, is equal to A, L, over BK. That's what you eventually get. You can actually rearrange this. Okay, so what if we just times by BK? So we get K RB over W, and then you've got L A and B. And we're going to start by making one for L. So we're going to have L is equal to, oh wait, hold on, it's not, there's no B there anymore. Uh, yeah, L is going to be equal to K R B of A W. So R B uh, or B R or whatever you want. I'm going to do B R actually, because it just works well with my notes. B R K. Now what we do is we reinsert this back into our equation for uh, quantity. Okay. So we have K A, and then we've got the new labor, which is going to be B R A W of k to the power of beta. Okay, so this is one way of representing it. Okay, uh, again, you could do labor first, you could do capital, it doesn't really matter. Um, also, uh, we may, may might also say that this is a first order condition as well here. Okay, so these are sort of our first order conditions for our minimization problem. Now this counts as number one, this counts as number two, and technically speaking, the third is our function here. So we have k alpha l beta, that's our third. Okay, you may want to write those three down, those guys, because those are our FOC. So now we've got this function here. Uh, we want to rearrange, essentially, to find a way of representing k in terms of just q and our other things, okay? Eventually what you get here is you get Q is equal to K A plus B uh, and then the B R A W is also to the power of B. And now we can sort of uh, move this over almost, per se to say. Uh, you get uh, A W B R to the power of B because we flipped it because it moved over Q is equal to K a, B, to the power of A, B, and then dividing by that, taking that power off or sort of rooting it, you can also put that on the other side. So that's now going to be K is equal to uh, Q, 1 over A plus B, and A over A, W, B, R, which is to the power of B over A plus B. So that's our representation of K. Now I'll let you guys do the other one by yourself because this is a fairly simple thing, uh, but simply put the equation for K instead of L is gonna be uh, L A W over B R. So it's essentially the other way around, but what you eventually get here, hold on, let me just circle these. So you eventually get K is equal to that, and then you've got L is equal to, let me just look at my final answer there. You get Q 1 over A plus B. And then it's going to be BR over AW uh, alpha, no, not alpha, A over A plus B. So these are our two.
okay? Now what we do now is we insert these two functions back into our cost function. This is gonna get messy, so just hold on. So our cost function, the one we're supposed to minimize, because remember, these are the cost minimizing values of capital and labor, the ones that we figured out from our Lagrange. So these are the cost minimizing values. We're gonna reinsert those back into our cost. So we get cost is equal to the R times this horrific thing. So Q one over alpha plus beta, A W of BR, B plus alpha beta, no, damn it. I keep on saying beta, it's just B this time. Plus the W for the wages for labor, and then we're gonna repeat it. This one is a long one, so it's a big old question. So I know why it could be tiring for a lot of you guys, but it is worth it. Okay, you will get it at the end. Okay, so now we have our total function. Essentially, what we need to do is we need to rearrange to get that thing in the bottom right corner. Now, one thing can be taken out quite easily, which is that Q1 over alpha beta. Okay, we can just take that out. Okay, but now we're left with this big function, which is R A W uh, B R and then beta, and then we've got the plus W B R over A W alpha alpha plus beta. There we go. So we now have a bit of more of a simplified one. So we've taken one bit out. Okay, now how do we get the RA and the WB out? Well, actually, it's really tricky. What you do is you actually have to break this down into four components. Actually, no, technically eight, but let's just not think about that. So let's think about this one in isolation, okay? I can break this down into four components, all right? Uh, you have the, uh, what is it, the AR? Yeah, you have the AR. Let me just double check my working here. Uh, yeah, hold on, let me just double check. <laughs> there's, there's a lot. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you have the AR, you have the RA as well. Yeah, so you've got the AR with the B, A beta. You've got the uh, WB with the same power. And then we've got two sort of things we're introducing here. We've got the RA, which I am aware does not exist, and we've got another RA. Now these both have powers of alpha A over A plus B and negative A over A plus B. Now the thing is, these two normally cancel out, but we've basically introduced them to sort of work with it as a counteract, okay? Now this will apply for both okay it'll be flipped for both but that's essentially it and what will happen is that that's for our first one okay for our second one you get uh let me just double check here you get yeah dear lord um there's a lot uh yeah you'll get bw a over a plus b and then you'll get r a a over A plus B, and then you'll get WB twice, which is our sort of imaginary one. And then that's going to be negative B, actually let's just do the positive Bs first, B over A plus B, and then negative B over A plus B. Now you can sort of see, if you're the observant type, that there are two similar in each. Okay, the WB with the B A plus B, and then the RA. Okay, you can sort of see these two. So these two can be factored out. Okay, I'm aware that this is massively complicated, but really bear with me here. So given that we factored these two out, we leave these two at our R in the function. So this gives us, hope you guys are keeping up here. Hopefully, maybe you might have my notes next to you. I don't know if they're totally helping you, but I hope that it can be enough. So we're taking out these two. We're going to start with our WB of the B over alpha A plus B. 
and then you've got the RA, which is the A, A plus B, and we've still got a bit left, okay? But thankfully, these are functions that actually quite neatly cancel themselves out. So we've got, let's just look at this big old function here. We've got R multiplied by A R B over A plus B times R A over minus A A plus B, okay? Let's just look at this bracket in isolation, okay? Then you've got W times, what is it? I'm just looking here. Ooh, that's a mistake I just saw. Uh, or is it a mistake? No, it isn't. Is it a mistake? No, it isn't. It isn't. <laughs> uh, then you've got W, which is B over W, A, A, B, and then you've got W, B. I think that's the negative B version. Yeah, you, that's the negative B. Negative B, A plus B. Now the thing is, each of these cancel, okay? If you think about this, especially this one, okay? You can change the sign here and flip it around. So you've got AR, B, A plus B, times AR again, A, A plus B. Adding these two together, you simply get A over R, A plus B, A plus B, which is just one, right? And given that we're multiplying by r, r times a over r makes a. It's the same for the next one. If you go through the motions, it ends up with b. So you end up with a plus b, okay? And so you're ending up with q1 over a plus b, ignore that, wb to the power of b plus ab, which we've got, R over A to the power of A over A plus B, which we've got, brackets, A plus B. And we've got it. I know that's a big, long string of working, but that is how it is. Okay, hope I helped. Let me just check how much time I've been recording. That is a long session. Um, hope you guys found this helpful. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll be linking my notes in the description just so you guys um, feel all right with it. But yeah, uh, yeah. Hope you guys have a good day, good night, wherever you're watching this. And uh, yeah, see you later. Bye.